Antonin Scalia's rise to Supreme Court justice is a distinctly American story. The son of an Italian immigrant, he earned his way into Harvard Law School through old-fashioned hard work and determination. In spending time with him, we found something we hadn't expected, a person so unpretentious and down-to-earth you could easily forget he sits on the Supreme Court. But what stands out is his sharp intelligence and street fighter personality, which he developed growing up in New York City. We used to uh, shoot baskets until it was time to go into dinner. Justice Scalia grew up in Elmhurst, Queens in the late 40s, early 50s, in a conservative, working-class neighborhood. There was a lot of uh, diversity in the backgrounds. There were some were Germans, there were uh, Irish, there were Puerto Ricans, there were English. It was a really mishmash, sort of a New York, New York uh, cosmopolitan neighborhood. Which, so which is yours, the second one? It's the from second the one. Which one? Up there the with one the... with the air conditioner. It did not have an air conditioner in those days, needless to say. Right, I can <laughs> remember those days. Oh, God, yeah. with the windows open and you'd uh, listen to the trolley going by and just, just lie there and sweat in the heat. I, I'm surprised to hear you say that, uh, you know, you have all that affection for New York. I didn't expect that. Oh, yeah. Well, I grew up So here. are you a Yankees my... fan? Absolutely. What else would I be? His being a real New Yorker is something he realized when his high school band went to march in a parade in Washington, D.C. These people just stood there and looked at us. You know, in New York, people say, hey, play something for us, you know? <laughs> you bums, why don't you play something? You know, they, 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 they were alive. They were <laughs> confrontational. Scalia's father, who emigrated from Sicily as a teenager, became a professor of Romance languages at Brooklyn College. His mother, a first-generation Italian-American, was a schoolteacher until her son was born in 1936. Nino was an only child. You don't have any cousins. No, it's, in, the... it's extraordinary. I have, no, I have no cousins. In an Italian family, yeah. you're the only not only of your parents, but of the whole yeah, family. Yeah. I mean, I cannot imagine the doting. Come on, now lay off. I, I, yes, I was spoiled. What do you think, having all that attention focused on you? I had a very secure feeling. So many people who loved me and uh, who would look out for me. I was a good speller. Yeah, well, my, my mother was, you know, she was a former teacher. So we went was, back with him to PS 13, his old elementary school in Elmhurst, where he stood out from the beginning. So if we looked at your report card, it would never say you got in trouble? No. No. Absolutely not. Be straight A's, too. Really? Absolutely. Straight A's? The Ab whole time? Come on. Would I lie? No, no, If you, no, you, if you can't lie. trust me, who can you trust, right? <laughs> Memorabilia. Up in one of his old classrooms, there it was in black and white his old report cards. Wow. You missed very few days of school. Mm -hmm. You were never late, and you never got anything ever less than an A. The same was true at Xavier in Manhattan, a military parochial high school run by the Jesuits. Scalia was a star, first in his class all four years, A's in Greek and Latin and everything else. I was never cool. <laughs> were you a bookworm? Were you one of those guys? I, I was a greasy grind. You were? Yeah. I worked really hard. My, my father and my mother uh, put me to that. And I, I enjoyed that. I don't like doing anything badly. His years at Xavier, where he went to Mass in this church, deepened his Catholic faith. Did you ever, ever want to be a priest? Gave that some thought. And decided no. And decided he was not calling me. What is the connection between your Catholicism, your Jesuit uh, education, and your judicial philosophy? It has nothing to do with how I decide cases. My job is to interpret the Constitution uh, accurately. And indeed, there are, there are anti-abortion think that the Constitution reeks a state to prohibit abortion. They say that the Equal Protection Clause requires that you treat a, a helpless human being that's still uh, in the womb uh, uh, the way you treat uh, other human beings. I think when the Constitution says 
that persons are entitled to equal protection of the laws. I think it uh, clearly means walking around persons. Appointed by Ronald Reagan, he was sworn in at age 50, the first Italian-American to ever serve on the Supreme Court. I, I have to thank uh, my wife, Maureen. He met his wife, Maureen, in Cambridge when she was a senior at Radcliffe, and he was in his last year at Harvard Law School. They have been married for 48 years and rarely disagree, they say. But when they do... She says she could have married so-and-so. And, and oh, not real. You do, you say that. And, of course, the reason she didn't was that so-and-so was wishy-washy. This is absolutely true. I, I uh, yeah. said, he will say, you would have been bored. I said, well, that's right, I would have been bored. <laughs> and you haven't been bored. I have not been bored. Whatever my Abs faults are, I am not, not wishy-washy. The marriage has flourished. They have nine children, 28 grandchildren. Why so many children? Nine? Well, as someone says, they're both overachievers, I guess. <laughs> well, we didn't set out to have nine children. We're just, just old-fashioned Catholics, uh, you know, playing what used to be known as Vatican roulette. <laughs> the Scalia children, ranging in age from 27 to 46, are all conservative, all successful, including two lawyers, a major in the army, a poet, and... If in an old-fashioned Catholic family with five sons, you don't get one priest out of it, we're in big trouble, right? I will say that the other four were very happy when, uh, when, when Paul <laughs> announced that, that he was going to take one for the team. I don't know. <laughs> the justice told us that he didn't go to the soccer games and the uh, piano recitals and things. You know, there are people... You know, my parents never did it for me, I, and I didn't take it personally. Oh, Daddy, come to my softball game. I, I mean, it's my softball game. He has his work. I got my softball game. Score, of course, she, she was very loyal. She, she went to all the games. Most. Yeah, I would get yeah. five minutes at each on a Saturday. <laughs> All their children are grown up now, and Scalia, after 22 years on the court, is starting another career as an author. His book, Making Your Case, The Art of Persuading Judges, is surprisingly breezy in that it's a primer for lawyers on how to win cases. His co-author is Brian Garner, an expert on legal writing. You say things in it like, be prepared. Look the judge in the eye. You almost make it sound like lawyers are imbeciles or... You would be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote the book together, occasionally sitting side by side, arguing. Surprisingly, Garner says, it was the justice who often showed humility by yielding. I thought, you punched pretty hard. You'd throw, you'd throw me a hard punch. And then sometimes he'd just want to see, could I punch back on the counterpoint, but often he, would, he could be brought around. He could be persuaded. It doesn't show that I'm humble. It just well, shows that I'm not stupid. I thought you were very <laughs> deferential, and surprisingly so. It was disarming to me. Oh, wow. Scalia, deferential? That's something you never hear about him on the court, where he has been unable to persuade his fellow justices to come over to his way of thinking. The only other originalist on the court is Justice Clarence Thomas. A lot of people thought that when you joined the court, you would use your charm to bring the other justices around uh, to side with you, and it hasn't happened. I'm not going to change their basic philosophy. These people have been thinking about the law for years. They're not going to suddenly say, oh, God, Nino explained it all to me. I understand that's not going to happen. That awareness has at times brought this man, usually so confident and charge ahead, to so bouts of despair, and he was taken aback that we knew about it. So you've um, apparently had some down times uh, in your tenure on the court so far, um, and I'm pointing to the term of 1995-96, when you wrote to former Justice Blackman at the time, and here's what you said. Mm. I am more discouraged than I have been at the end of any of my previous nine terms. You also wrote that you were beginning to repeat yourself, and you did not see much use in it anymore. Gee, I, I don't, I hadn't remembered that I had written that. It says, it's, I am beginning to repeat myself. That's true. That is something that, uh, that, that gives me some, some concern. I mean, after a while, you know, 
I'm saying the same things in today's dissent that I said in a dissent 20 years ago. Around that uh, same time, you wrote, the court must be living in another world, day by day, case by case. It is busy designing a constitution for a country I don't recognize. Yeah, that's, that's how I felt. Past. Uh, it's been less, uh, less dire in, in more recent years. In other words, you've had down times. Yeah, I think so. I'm happier sometimes than at other times. And, and the end of a term, I don't care what term it is, it, it's usually, uh, usually uh, a disappointment. That's because, until recently, he was often on the losing side in cases he cared most about. Over the last several years, Justice Scalia has reached outside the court, speaking out publicly about his philosophy in hopes of influencing the next generation. It's a role he relishes. Little kids come to the court. They're brought by their teachers, and they recite very proudly what they've been taught. I mean, this is how, you know, widespread the... The Constitution is a living document, you know, and I have to tell them it's a dead document. That's... <laughs> He says the speeches energize him. But at 72, I wondered if he ever thinks about retiring. When I first came on the court, I thought I would for sure get off as soon as I could, which would, would have been when I turned 65, because, you know, justices retire at full salary. So there's no reason not to leave and go off and, and do something else. Um, so, you know, essentially I've been working, I've been working for free, which, which probably means I'm too stupid to be on the Supreme Court. <laughs> you should get somebody with more sense. Uh, but I cannot, uh, I can, what, what happened is simply I cannot think of what I would do for an encore. I can't think of any other job that, that I would find as interesting and as satisfying.